Welcome back to the Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show. 
right there, David Lee Roth for Yankee Rose. You know, I'm not really a big Van Halen fan at all. I know people, like, they can't believe it. I'm not really a fan of Van Halen or David Lee Roth, but that song just reminds me of the summertime, and it is Memorial Day weekend. It's sort of the unofficial kickoff of summer of 2022. So I kind of like to open up every Memorial Day show with that song, and we kind of kept the tradition going here. We didn't get to do it last year because we were off the air, but we're back right now. Beautiful weather today here in New York. We had a kind of a crappy uh, start to the weekend yesterday with a lot of rain, but it picked up, and it's really nice outside right now. As much as I love doing this show, I hate when I have to get out of the pool to get changed and go down to the studio to come on in, but it's a great one. Hey, we got a good show for everybody tonight. Michael Pottery Bow of Glacier is our guest tonight. We'll be calling Mike in about 45 minutes. We're going to play as much music as we can tonight, and uh, we'll get to some of the metal news. Not much going on, not much really happening. Uh, I spoke with Nigel Rocket yesterday. We're going to have him on the show uh, next weekend. They were inducted into the Metal Hall of Fame at the Maryland Death Festival last night. Uh, we got a bunch of great guests lined up for, for June also. I'm just confirming the last couple of weekends, uh, but we're looking pretty good. All right, how about we get into some Agent Steel? Guilty is charged.
All right, Possession Lady in White. Right before that shock treatment by Tension. I absolutely love that band. I saw them quite a few times back in the day uh, when they were playing. They started out in the late 70s, going into the mid-80s as Deuce. But like with a lot of bands, another band had the name. They had it copyrighted. They didn't want to get involved in a lawsuit. They changed the name to Tension and put out their one and only record, really, <clears throat> back in the time. I think it was 86 when Breaking Point came out. Originally, Marty Freeman played guitar in that band when it was Deuce. A uh, great bunch of guys. I think I had almost all of them on the show at one point or another. Billy Giddens, he had a number, another band going called Alloy 20. That was pretty good. So if you could find anything by them. I don't think they're together anymore. Uh, and Tom Gass, who was the singer and guitar player for the band. Tom works in Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, in, in the New Mexican... In New, in New Mexican. In the New Mexico desert. I remember when I had him on the show, it was one of our anniversary shows, he had to drive out of there because you can't get cell phone reception there. That's where they, they kind of put the Manhattan Project together. It's a nuclear science energy laboratory for the, for the federal government. Like the security getting out of that place, it took forever to get this interview going because he had to get out of there, get far enough away to get a cell phone signal because it's out in the desert. And it kept breaking up throughout the whole thing, but he was a real trooper about driving further and further away to make it happen. But great guy. I mean, they did get back together for a short period of time, mostly like for one-off shows. I hope they can do it again someday because they are just so great. I mean, really, one of my all-time favorite bands... Tom had a band called Ballistic and another band called... I mean, he had a, quite a few bands, but Ballistic and War Dog were two other really good bands. Much different than Tension. They were more like speed and thrash metal, but a real solid, solid outfit. Check it out if you can. All right, we're going to play a little bit more music before we get on the phone with Mike. How about we do... Let me see here. You know, I, I had a few new things to play. Maybe I'll get to that after the interview. We'll kind of stick with the classic stuff right now. How about some Virgin Steel? <laughs>
Mortal Sin, Martyrs of Eternity, right before that, some classic Steel Avenger with the Executioner. And we kicked off that set with Virgin Steel and Guardians of the Flame. To me, I love Virgin Steel, but I really like the earlier stuff with Jack Star on guitar. The stuff they did later on just got a little convoluted, and I don't know. It just wasn't interesting, to be honest with you. A lot of these theme records based on Greek mythology and, and, and all that other stuff, it just didn't do nothing for me in those later records. But, you know, David DeFeast is the main guy in that band. He pretty much does everything. He writes the music, composes it. And I have to tell you, his voice still stands up till today. So, give him credit for that. All right, we're going to give Mike a call in uh, about five or six minutes. Uh, we'll play maybe one more, maybe play a Glacier tune right before then, and we'll, we'll get Mike on the phone. I was reading before that, you know, uh, Chris Jericho from Fozzy has a Kiss cover band. I forgot the name of it. i got to be honest with you. I don't even remember. Uh, Quarantine or something with a K. And they just released their new single off the next Outcome record called Silver Spoon. They cover a lot of Kiss songs. They cover the songs that nobody really cared about from Kiss. You know, like the later era Kiss stuff. And uh, I can't believe, like, you know, cover bands are putting out records and people are buying it. These are cover bands. You know, buy the Kiss record, hear the original version of it. Same thing, I saw that there's a documentary coming out on an ACDC cover. It's like a full, blo- uh, like a full blown documentary. Like, you know, all the bells and whistles on a ACDC cover band called Back in Black. Who's watching this? I mean, is somebody actually sitting there saying, damn, I'm dying to see a documentary about one of the 50,000 ACDC cover bands out there. Let, I, can't, I can't wait to hear this story about how they got together and they started to cover other people's music. What makes that interesting? I mean, is that how far we've gone that. It's just about cover bands, whether it's on a video and a DVD about a documentary or an album, that we don't buy original music no more, care about original music, you know, give that... You see these bands, they have them on the show, we talk all the time, they're like, it's hard to get people's attention, it's hard to, you know, draw them into the new music. But yet, they'll go out there and they'll spend their money on on cover bands and on cover music. I'm not saying anything about the guys that go out on the weekend, you know, and have some fun playing covers in a band. It's not for me. It's not my thing. I'd rather see the original band if they are still together. But I just don't get it. It's just the way it is right now. I don't know. All right, never mind that. Let's get some Glacier on. We'll do some classic first. I'll get Mike on the phone right after that. And then we'll get the interview going. So how about we do uh, Devil in Disguise? <laughs>
All right, let's get Mike in the line. So far, we've been batting a thousand. Uh, we made connections the last three weeks in a row with the live show. I haven't screwed up anything, so let's see if we can do it one more time. Well, that's not good. It didn't go through. Let's try one more time. Yeah, I guess Mike has a block probably on the Skype calling to his cell phone. So let me uh, play another Glacier song and I'll dial him on the regular phone. We'll get him on a landline. Hang on.
Good. I was trying. I was trying to call you through our switchboard, but it was blocked. It probably comes up as an unknown number on your phone. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. That's okay. Hey, listen, it's great to have you on here today. I really wanted to have you on two years ago, but the album came out. And I just ended my live show because I kind of got burnt out. But as soon as I came back, I said I got to get you back on the show now. Nice. So listen, I'm a big fan of Glacier going back to the early days. I was happy to, you know, when it finally came together again. And, you know, it would have been nice if the whole band could have been reunited. But, you know, that doesn't happen a lot of times. So I'm glad that you decided to carry the torch on. Yeah, I just thought that it was incredible getting Tim and Lauren to play on the new album. That was a great thing as it was. But I know over the years there have probably been a lot of attempts, I would imagine, to get that lineup back together. But it just didn't happen. But... What a solid record that was. And, you know, a lot of people said you know, it kind of held up to the old stuff, but yet it, it was new. Because, you know, you can't recreate something from 30 years ago, but it kind of stood true to the, to the Glacier sound. Right, exactly. I was I was pretty amazed when it all came together and the recordings were all done and, and I was listening to it. And I'm like, it does sound like Glacier, but it does sound new also. Yeah, great job. You know, let's kind of go back to the beginning for a lot of people because there's such a convoluted history of the band and how it came about and who was in, who was out. And I remember having Sam on the show right before he passed away. And, you know, he, he's just like, like we could never find the singer. Like, you had a great singer in the band. What do you mean you couldn't find the singer? So how did right. it come about that you hooked up with the band? I'm guessing in the early to mid-80s. What was that? Say that one more time. How did it come about that you hooked up with the band? Because I believe they were around from maybe 79, 80 they got started. And a few years later, you hooked up with them. So um, their original singer, Scott Prinzing, was, decided to go to college. And so he was the bass player and singer. And so they, he knew Tim Proctor, the bass player, and got Tim in the band. And then he, let's see, I had a, um, a girlfriend that um, when I was in my old band, Harlot, and uh, we were playing shows down here in Salem from Portland. And anyway she told me about this band that was looking for a singer and how they were going to be you know really big like Iron Maiden and everything and so I'm like okay I'll go check it out so I went to I think it was Pat's mom's basement and it was just a little tiny place and I I sang a priest song and an Iron Maiden song and I was in the band (laughs) as simple as that right (laughs) yeah I mean you know there, there was a great scene going on up in that area at the time I mean was it vibrant? Was it really happening, or did we just kind of imagine that? No, the Northwest was huge yeah. in, in metal. We used to, we actually opened for Wild Dogs tons of times. Matt McCourt. <laughs> yep, Wild Matt. Yeah, he's a crazy guy, fun guy. He's off the wall. Yep. So that, that was all good back then, but, you know, the Ready for Battle demo was the first thing. I, I Being a tape trader back in the 80s, I traded somebody I knew over in... Uh, over on the West Coast for that, and I was like such a fan of the band from that point on. So now the demo right. comes out, the album comes out, the EP, I should say, comes out, and there's you and two other singers on there. And I had asked, I said, how did that happen that, you know, there were three uh, different singers on, on that record? Okay, so this is what happened. Um, we went in, we had a, a record producer come up from L.A. They paid for us to go to um, a studio in Portland and record when heaven's at hand with me singing and uh when it was all said and done the guy told took sam and pat aside and told them that uh they should look for a new singer that i couldn't do it so they kicked me out of the band and um and then all of a sudden they they got an offer for an ep but they didn't have enough songs so they had to record two more songs so they didn't they didn't I don't know if they wanted wanted um, Rex or um, Keith in the band permanently but they got each of them to do one song and that made that gave them enough for an EP and that's how the album came about you know to me it doesn't sound like the way things should go I mean especially with a band and then the debut record I mean there should be some stability there how can they say you couldn't sing when they've had you on the band sing all those songs before? What changed? Just the producer's opinion of it? I don't. I don't know. Just some inner turmoil. You know, they they were. Um, I don't. I'm not saying they all, but um, a few of them wanted wanted me to do 
um, they wanted me to go singing lessons and a bunch of stuff, and I was, but it, I guess it just wasn't enough, and um, it just fell apart. Yeah, do you think that really was the beginning of the end to the band? It did go on for a few more years. Sam was out, I think, not long after that, maybe a year or so late. He doesn't consider, he didn't consider anything that happened after that to be Glacier. But, you know, Lauren right. was still in the band, and other people still in the band. I think Pat was still in the band at that time. You know, so Yeah, they all they all moved down to L.A. the same time I did with a couple of my buddies, and it was weird. I never saw them down there, but they all were down there. And they couldn't make anything happen. They couldn't find a singer, and it it just crumbled. Um, uh, Pat and Pat and Tim and Lauren moved back, and Sam stayed down there. And um, then later, uh, Sam came. I think Sam came back because he was in a few other bands afterward. I think one was Sean Sun and Shine. He, Sean is one of the guitarists that took over for Tommy Thayer in Black and Blue. Um, and I don't know what other bands, but the others, you know, got back together and did the, the Mach 5 and uh, the 88. And I think it's a great, a great EP. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because like I, I look at all this and I'm like there were so many missteps because to me, you know, Glacier had the look, the sound. I mean, to me, it had everything going for it. It just needed the time to gel together and make things work. And it seems like more often than not, it's it's personality clashes. You know, if it isn't like a management issue or just things not happening, you know. But when personalities clash, it, it takes something that could have been so great, maybe carried on for decades, and it just goes right. away, and it goes away just like that. Yeah, before Sam passed, I was talking to him to, uh, there was a promoter in Chicago that wanted us to do a um, reunion, and I was talking to him about it, and and we were at a, I think it was Lauren's birthday party or something up in Portland to get together, and he took me aside and apologized for the way he treated me, and um, told me that they were releasing the, re- reissuing the, out, the EP, so... I thought that was pretty cool, and and I told him about the promoter wanting to do the reunion, and um, he's like, well, I don't know what we could do. We'd need to get another guitarist and another bass player and another drummer because those guys are all off doing their own thing and don't have time for it. So we, we chatted a bit about it, and it just never happened, and then Sam was gone. Yeah, right after that. But you did put it together, you know, as Devil in Disguise, was it, did you not want to use the Glacier name at the time because you felt maybe there'd be issues with the other band members and you figured you'd go under, under that name for now? Or did you think about continuing Well, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have permission to use it. And then after we we played quite a few shows, um, they, uh, they um, agreed to let us use the name. Would you have kept it going as Devil in Disguise and just recorded the music under that? Or did you just feel like, you know, these were like Glacier shows and you know, you're just doing it because of the name issue? Uh, well, we we were using Devil in Disguise because I didn't have the name yeah. permission, so we just did it. We did three shows, and um, and then we did a couple more in the Northwest, and the guys thought you know we were doing really well, and and they decided to let us use the name. That was good. I'm glad that it changed and it worked out that way. I mean, how was the reaction during that for that first show? I mean, because. Nobody's really heard these songs in like decades, you know, especially like with you singing them, especially live. So I mean, right. how, how was the reaction like? You know, because you have a lot of younger fans that come that don't even know the band yet. Then you have the old guard that you know, it's like holy cow, I'm gonna see you know, like a version of Glacier out there right now. Right when so the the year before we played, well, well, the first show we actually did was in Germany because um, we were the only we were only going to do one show. That's what the whole thing was about, and. Um, uh, we were going to play in Chicago for the Ragnarokker Festival, and the Ragnarokker Festival fell apart. And um, but uh, Bob Byrne and Michael Mendoza and Shane Merrill, they had got together and and made it happen. They changed the name and it became Legions of Metal. Yeah. So the we were going to play that festival, and then um, Oliver from keep it true got a hold of bob and asked him what's this i hear about 
Devil in Disguise and Glacier Mike and all this going on. And Bob told him about it. And he said, well, are they any good? And, uh, Bob hadn't heard us yet. And uh, so when later that night we were doing practice and for the first time we got together with the, guy, the other guys that were put together to do the project. And um, it came along pretty good. And then I was... I talked to Oliver and he invited us to play Keep It True. So the first show back was Keep It True in Germany. That's a big festival, probably one of the biggest, you know, of, of all the festivals oh, that the other ground. So it must have been pretty wild, and especially for those fans because they live and breathe, you know, all the old stuff. And it must have been humongous when you went there and they, you know, you went over on that crowd. I was pretty, I was, so I was waiting for my guys. It was, daytime still yeah. and I was waiting for my guys they were up on the stage doing their sound check and stuff and I'm standing down on the side behind the curtain and I'm pacing back and forth and I'm like oh my god I can't do this and I, yeah. I, I, so I decide I want to see you know how big's a crowd nobody knows who Devil in Disguise is let alone Glacier you know and I pull the curtain down and I was just oh my god it was it was packed and <laughs> so then I'm really freaking out because I hadn't been on stage for 30 years wow and so I'm pacing back and forth, I can't do it, I can't do it. And all of a sudden they start in with ready for battle and my cue's coming and I, I go up and I hit my cue and I was fine after I got, after I started singing and it was just, I was nervous at first and then after that I was pretty good. I can imagine. Did you really think people forgot like who the band was in the songs? Because, you know, like I said, most of those fans live for that stuff and they don't forget, they remember, but... Were you not sure oh, no. about Every, how we go Everybody over? was singing. Everybody yeah. was singing along. It was incredible. It's got to be a great, especially like you said, for your first show back in 30 years playing that. It has to be a great feeling. It has to encourage you to want to go on more after that, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. It was it was exhilarating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so happy, man. But now, like, after this is all over, like you said earlier, you thought it was only going to be this one-off show this one time. When did it come to the point where you say, you know what, let's keep this going? Well, we we didn't even have to do say that. We did, we kept getting offers, so we played. Let's see. So the first one was Keep It True, and then we played Chicago, and then we played Chicago again, opening for um, Doro Pesh, and then we played Northwest Metal Fest in Seattle, and then we played Up the Hammers in Greece, um, Bogota, Colombia the Jaguar Festival, um, Trueheim Festival in Germany. Uh, there was another one in Amsterdam, Amstel, <laughs> Uh Got Heavy Metal, what is that one? Heavy Metal Maniacs? Yeah, that was a great one too. But it just kept going and going. It was awesome. What, what and, then, and then COVID hit. <laughs> yeah, I know. It killed everybody. And, you know, oh, I know. And we, we put out a new album. We can't play any of the songs live because of COVID. I know, because yeah, album did come out like right at the height of it, like when it was really at its peak in October. I mean, everything's it was COVID, COVID, COVID. But the good thing is that in a way, because nobody can go out, they were all playing the music at the house. So at least I got to know the music and the album. Now, you, true, you, you're recording the passing of time. Now, you know, do you say to yourself, we're going to try to recreate that old sound? Or, you, know, you got all new members in the band now. They're all kind of tight with each other from the Chicago area. Do you just say let's create a whole new version of Glacier? Or do you try to stay true to the original music? I mean, because there isn't any of the original members writing the music besides you. Right. So how do you work this out? How do you say, you know, let's just see how it goes and, like, write music and see where it lands? Well, Adam, our drummer, writes most of the songs. Um, Selvis writes most of the guitar stuff. And um, I just, I think they've just, they're old souls. And <laughs> they're young guys, though. Well, yeah. I guess they're they're older, but they're younger to me. Um, but uh, it just it just clicked. We do really good together, and and um, the songs I think sound like glacier, sound like Glacier songs. Yeah. And we I we usually share and, and let Tim and Lauren listen to them and get opinions from them and stuff. And but they loved it all along, and it's it's really a lot of fun. <laughs> It is a solid record, like you said, because it came out at, you know, not a great time for, for bands to promote things, especially on the live front. But when you think about it, all the festivals that you've been a part of, 
you've gone all over the world in the last couple of years, or at least before COVID hit. That has to be a great feeling to say, like, you know, I never was able to even leave my little neck of the woods all those years with the band, but now I'm in Amsterdam, I'm in Spain, I'm in Germany, I'm all over the place. That's got to be right. a, a killer yeah, we feeling. Only, we only played in Portland. Yeah. Um, we played one time in Eugene, but mainly Portland. We, I, I think we probably only played a dozen, maybe a dozen shows. Yeah. You've done more than that now. Just is it at the point now where you feel like you know you'll just try to get on the festivals and do the festival circuit every year, and maybe some. You're looking to just go out on tour for as much as you can and play out as live, any way you can. Yeah, I want to. I'm willing to play any way we can. Um, it's harder in the states to, you know, to get shows. They, I don't know. We found we found we were going to work a uh, tour thing together with another band and it, we, it ended up turning into a festival so we're playing in uh, Massachusetts at Ralph's in a week <laughs> nice. or two weeks that's a pretty big club pretty popular club over there yeah it is yeah that'd be great with the record now you're thinking about maybe anything doing anything with the record again to get it out there get the public's attention going on it again now that you're able to go out and play live yeah we're gonna we'll be playing new songs and old songs that's fantastic what about another record, a follow-up? Because it'll be almost two years this September, October since it came out. Is there anything you happen like with new material being worked on? We actually got, we have two singles that we're going to put out, and um, they're almost ready to go. And then we've, we're working on an al- another album. We've got lots of ideas and lots of music to choose from, and we just need to work out all the, all the bugs and put them together and go from there. Most of the band is still in Chicago, right? Yeah, um, Adam and uh, Mike Masalbus and Alex is our our bass player. He's in, um, I think he's in Indiana, and uh, and then Vince, um, he is our other guitarist. What are the challenges of having guys all over the place? I know today with the internet and you know file file sharing and all that stuff. It can kind of, ha- you know, it's a little easy. You can go back and forth with everything, but do you prefer to do everything in a room together, or is there really no option? Well, right they actually practice every weekend together. Yeah. And um, I think it's a it's a couple hour drive for Alex, and um, and then I try to fly down, you know, every once in a while, and I'm actually going over to Chicago on uh, Friday. Oh, nice. We're gonna have practice all weekend, and then. Um, and get ready for the festival. Oh, that'd be killer. Hey, talking about the old Glacier stuff, was there anything still left lying around that you might think you could go back to and rework it into new music, or is that just in, you know history? Well, there are there are five or six songs still um, that have never been recorded. I think a couple of them we played live, and um, but I don't know if we're if we're ever going to record them or not, and. Uh, so we're just doing new stuff right now. That's great. So how's things looking for this year? I mean, I know you got the festival coming up, the show at Ralph's. I mean, anything else lined up uh, that you have, you know, definite plans, or is it still kind of yeah, hard we've to got, things? We're doing a, a festival in um, December down in Mexico City, and we're trying to line up a show in Chicago um, uh, at Livewire, and then... We're going to um, Germany again. We're playing at Headbangers Open Air oh, in July. Show. Wow. You know, like you talk about, like, you know, the early days of the band, you know, there could be a lot of friction between members that causes a lot of problems and, and you know, leads to breakups eventually. I think it's more fun now. Is like everybody kind of knows their place in the band and what they have to do, and it's just for fun. Because back then, you know, everybody wanted to make it. They wanted to get signed to a major label. They wanted to be the next Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. And there could be a lot of pressure on people to make that happen. And sometimes that's what causes a band to break up. And now, 30 years later, is it purely just for fun now where you're enjoying yourself and you're getting to travel around the world and play for fans and there's no pressure or you feel like there's any pressure on you now? Well, there's always pressure. <laughs> but um, mainly, yeah, we're, we're having fun. We enjoy doing it. And, and uh, you know, there's always going to be a little tension between a couple guys once in a while, but it, it's it's not like it like very much at all just once in a while you have a little squabble but overall we get along great guys are all great that's good 
the first rehearsal, I mean, did you feel like, you know, I don't remember what I'm doing. I don't remember how these songs go. What are the words to this song? How did the lyrics go? Did you have that, those kind oh, of yeah, moments? Oh, yeah, I had some hard ones on, on uh, when I was down there a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> did you have to change anything because you just couldn't remember how it went? Um, no, I just been so <laughs> I've just been listening to the songs over and over and over, yeah. memorizing them and singing along with them, you know? Yeah, because I've had a lot of bands come to the show that have gotten back together for 30 years, and I would tell the guitar player, like, you know, it's, it's like getting back on a bike, you know, it just comes back there, and he goes, he goes, I had to change half the songs we had, the original version, I couldn't remember how the chords went. You know, so it, right. it, does, it does happen when you don't play something for so long, you know? Yeah, and I'm, and I'm getting old, I can't remember shit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, Rob Paul for uses the monitor for the lyrics, I'm sure you can get through it. Yeah. <laughs> That that's what happens. But after the original, after you you know you parted ways with the band in the beginning, did you just give up on music altogether? Because I don't remember you playing with anybody else after that. No, I um I actually did. Um, my old band Harlot, we got back together and we started doing originals, and we were just about ready to do an album, and then two of the guys bailed, and that's when it all just imploded and. I ended up moving to L.A. with a couple of guys, and I hated it down there. People were just a bunch of users, and it it just wasn't it wasn't my kind of scene. And I ended up moving back and completely got out of music. Yeah, you know, when you talk about bands and putting people together into a band, do you think a lot of people just don't realize what's involved in being in a band, and that causes them to want to leave? You know, it's a lot of you know, it's a lot of riding around in a van, a lot of hard stuff, a lot of dedication. You kind of gotta just throw everything into the basket and hope it lands, but. It seems yep, like, and your band members need to be your best friends, you know? Yeah, it seems like they just get into it and then realizing you know, what all the hard work is behind it. It's not like in the movie Rockstar, you know? It, there's a lot of behind-the-scenes work that's down and dirty, and you got to be willing to just go along for the ride. Yeah. Do you think that's one of the biggest problems about keeping a band together today is just find the members that are willing to dedicate their time to the band? Yep, and, it, and it's, it's hard when you're, you know, when you're later in life because you have a family now. You have... Responsibility. You have a house payment. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it's tough, you know. I, I'm pretty lucky because I work for myself, so I can say, okay, I'm going. <laughs> but, but you know, like other guy, other my other guys, uh, a couple of them, they they work for contractors, and they gotta, you know, ask them if they if they can go and do the shows. So. But like I said, when you're young, you don't think twice about it. The job's not important. You know, just, you know, being in that band is your job, and you have to try to make it work. But it's tough, and there's a lot of lean times, and it does get harder as you get older. So I guess you kind of have to work the band schedule around all the member schedules, too, because like I said, people have families, jobs. So it must make it difficult. Yeah, it does. But you make it work. What was that? But you do make it work. Oh, yeah. That's the most important thing. So Mike, when do you think we're going to see the new record? I mean, are the singles going to come out this year? The singles should be out, I would say, within a month. Oh, that's pretty good. And they're, they're good, too. I can imagine. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I've listened to them over and over and over, and they just, they're so powerful and epic. <laughs> you know, as a fan, when we hear these songs for the first time, you know, and if you're a fan, you know, you just fall in love with it. You hear that riff and that vocals, and you're like, Wow. But as a person who's writing it and working on it over and over and over again, like day in and day out, and you know, it sounds like you still get that feeling, even though you're writing the music and it's yours, you still get that feeling as the fan where, like, wow, this is really good, you know? Yep, exactly. That's an important. So, which, thing. which which song on the on the new album do you like the best? Uh the one I just played a few minutes ago is my favorite. I mean, the whole album. I always got to say the whole album is great start to finish, because then people get, <laughs> you know. But I right. love I love live for the whip. Oh, do you really? Yeah, yeah. That's so. That's an early '80s song. Really? Yeah. We actually that was the first song that we recorded. We um, Scott Prinzing had a friend that was going through the recording studio program at uh, Mount Hood Community College, and uh, so he set it up so we could come out and record the song. And I, I, I do not know where that original recording of, of it is. I wish I. I wish I still had mine, but I don't know where it is. But, uh, yeah, that was the very first song that we recorded. I had no idea it went that far back. That's probably why it, it, it draws my attention, because it's like that old sound. But, you know, The Temple and the Tomb is another great song on the record. 
Vala. I mean, you really, I think you hit a home run from start to finish with all eight songs on the record. Yeah, it came along really well. I, I was pretty happy with it. Yeah, I mean, when, when, the, when the songs did start coming together, were you saying to yourself, yeah, I, I think we got it. This is it. You know, uh, this is what it should be. Yep. Yeah. And, and the new songs, is it kind of following where this album left off, or is it going in a little different direction? Um, you know, I really don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> The the uh, the two new singles are they totally fit with what we just did, and um, they're a little more, maybe I don't they're a little heavier I would say, but they're they're kind of it's like the difference between a a low budget film and a and a super you know a top dog film it's, I, know, I, know I don't know how saying. to explain it no I get it but the, the two new ones are just they're so powerful and I just can't I can't describe it it's, it's just they're really good that's great <laughs> is, is it still going to be coming out on New Remorse are you with a different label are you doing it on your own no we're just doing these two ourselves good and um, and then um, I don't know what we're going to do for the album yet we're going to you know check out a couple other labels and see what goes yeah. I mean, what do you look for in a label today? It's not the 80s anymore. You know, you don't get that kind of support or backing like you did in the day. Also, the debt that came with the advances. But, I mean, are you just looking for good distribution, a label that's going to back you up, maybe help you with some tour support or just distribution? Is that really all it comes down to? Actually, all of that, you know. Yeah. Um, distribution. Um, it would be nice if they'd help get some shows, but it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and then we we sold we sold a ton of records on that new one, so it, it was pretty it was pretty profitable. We made a decent that decent amount of money off of it to cover the the recording. <laughs> yeah, that's good. The passing of time, the title, does it have any real specific meaning about the band and the years that went by between it? It was just something you guys. Decided? Well, that's that's exactly what it was. The yeah. from the early to the later, and um, we we even put in the the hand with reaching with the the hourglass yeah. you know from the original and um got it i don't know if you know or not but our artist passed from covid no i didn't know that did it yeah yeah I'm daniel sure. charles he was such a super nice guy great ta- talent he was a tattoo artist uh originally when we were looking for um an artist to do the cover i wanted old school i wanted like the like the um, oh, oh what's Manila Road yeah uh, the, there's two that I just really love that were done by a French artist and uh, I was looking for a painter and I was this guy was a, already a Glacier fan he had bought a couple shirts and CDs and stuff from me and we ended up being friends and talking all the time and anyways I um he uh, he sent me some of his art, and I'm like, oh my god, you're really great. And I said, do you paint? And he said, yeah, I do paintings also. And he sent me a couple pictures that he had painted, and I'm like, oh wow. I said, would you be interested in doing the Glacier cover album cover? And he's like, oh my god, I would be honored. So after we had the the lyrics and the music and songs put together for the first. I think the first three songs I sent him the three songs and the and the words the lyrics and he sent me a sketch within like an hour <laughs> and I, I was looking at it like oh my god that that's really cool and it was it was basically the album cover already and he added all kinds of detail later but he, he came up with a great concept just right off the bat. Yeah. You, know, you remember what it was like back when we were kids. We bought half of our albums based on the album cover because there was no internet. We didn't know who a lot of these bands were. We went to our, our local record store. You saw a cool album cover and, and you bought the record sometimes not knowing who the band even was. Oh, yeah. My local record store here, I would buy records just because of what the album cover looked like. I didn't even hear of the, of the band yeah. ever. And I'd just buy it. Because there were, think of it, there's tons of bands, just like Glacier, that you would never hear of unless your record store had brought those in, you know? Yeah. 
it's amazing when you think about it. I mean, Glacier has a bigger following now, and it's getting more, you know, deserve recognition now than it did in, in the early days, and it's prime. Right. That's it. That's amazing. Yeah, we had, um, when our album came out on the, what is it, the, those page on YouTube, New Wave of Traditional Heavy Metal? Yeah. Uh, we had, um, they, <laughs> we would have won, but because we we were an old group, but I'm the only old group. <laughs> <laughs> but we had, we had a huge amount of, um, of uh, clicks on that album, and it was there were other we compared it to a few other bands that were older bands like we were and um and they came out theirs came out the same time and I was watching the numbers and we were double and triple of some that's fantastic Mike before the, you know uh, you did the devil in disguise thing and, and you were talking with Sam about getting back together were there any attempts in the, in the years prior to that to try to put the band back together maybe in the 90s or 2000s or was that the first time after all those years that there was any talk remotely of Glazier trying to reunite so after I was out of the band I rarely even talked to any of those guys once in a while I would go to a concert with Pat but I wasn't in privy on any of the band stuff at all and um, it just so happened that Sam and I talked a little bit at Lauren's birthday thing so and that was the first time after all those decades that it was even talked about maybe making it happen. Yep. Yeah. What do you think? You think it would have went on if, uh, you know, Sam didn't pass away? Was he maybe really like the whole block and start of the band continuing I, on? I don't know. He might not have even let it happen. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a shame. But I'm glad that it is happening now, and I'm glad that we're going to get some brand new music coming real soon. Mike, I'm not going to keep you. I know it's a Sunday afternoon. It's Memorial Day weekend. I appreciate you taking your time out to talk to us. I'm going to play some more music by Glacier, and I can't wait for those singles to come out, man. I'll be playing them the second I get them. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mike. Have a great weekend. Enjoy. Happy Memorial Day. You too. And Take happy care. happy birthday from, the other, from last week. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> you got it, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. All right. Let's get one more Glacier song on. I know I played two before, but you know what happened? I couldn't get Mike on the line. So let's do one more, and then we'll get back to the regular program.
right. Speak no evil by Glacia. I, I had to grab the first thing I could to put on. I really wanted to get something off the new record on, but I just didn't have it on on the switchboard at the time. I hope the interview came through okay, because what happens is if people have a block in their phone for Skype numbers, this switchboard uses Skype to call out. It won't go through, so I did just have to get him on my cell phone and kind of hold the mic up. <laughs> the cell phone. It was all I could do last minute just to get the interview going. So hopefully it came through okay. All right, we're going to get more music on here tonight. Who do we have on the show next week? I think I said it earlier, didn't I? Nige Rocket from Onslaught is on the show next week. The week after that, we have Iron Flame on the show, then Gwar, and we have a couple of other guests we're lining up for the end of the month. I can't believe this is like the last couple of days of May. I'm happy in a way because we start June in a few days, and that means I'm 20 weeks away from retiring. I cannot wait. I'm counting every single one of them down. I cannot wait to retire and never have to go to work again. Not like I do much of it now anyway, but <laughs> I can officially not go in and do anything. All right. How about we do some Man of War? We'll do some classic Man of War. I remember I, I, when I used to do the Metal Matinee shows on Wednesday uh, when I was on Block Talk Radio, it was always like a one-hour theme show. Sunday show was, you know, all music and uh, guests with the interviews, but every Wednesday I did a theme show, and I did one called The Holy Trinity. And it was about bands, and, and Imam was mentioning something about this before with the, Mor- with the Mortal Sin. It's like they only had the, those two good first records, and you got to forgive me, I'm all tongue-tied here. And I did a show called The Holy Trinity about bands who had three great records, and then everything after that was either shit, at least in my opinion, or they didn't put anything else at all after that. And to me, Man of War was one of those bands, you know? Battle Hymns, Into Glory... And held England with three classic records. I did like some of the stuff that came out with Ross the Boss after that, but it, to me, it just got a little repetitive and a little boring. It was the same, you know, Death the False Metal theme, and it just, you know, the loincloth. It, you know, sometimes when bands have an image, it does wear a little thin after a while. And for me, with Man of War, those first three records were it, and they kept it going on and on and on for about another 40 years after that. But the last of the great Man of War records, in my opinion, held England. Let's get on the title track. Quest for the grail to England we sail. 
by Misto Disto out of the Netherlands. That comes off the one and only record from 1986. The rules have been disturbed. They changed the name right after this record. I mean, they put a demo out after this album. Uh, no AIDS in Hell, I think it was called. And then they changed the name to Mandator. And, uh, Mandator. and they put out maybe two or three records or EPs under that name for breaking up, getting back together, breaking up. I think they got back together and broke up at least once a decade until like around 2020, and they called it quits again. But that was a great album. It really was. Think about 83, the band got started in the Netherlands. Not a lot of stuff going on like that out there. It took them a few years to really gain any traction, but it was a solid record. And I just saw that Leather Leone is in the studio working on her new solo record. She's also got Veronica Freeman in there with her. I guess she's going to be on a couple of songs, maybe some duets. I'm going to reach out to Leather, find out when the album's coming out, and we'll get her back on the show. And uh, maybe get V to come back on with her. I miss talking to V. She must have been on my show a dozen times over the years. And I always have so much fun with her. Her husband passed away a few years ago, and she completely went off the radar. It devastated her. She completely went off the radar after that. You know, she doesn't respond on social media anymore. I've tried to reach out to her. I've texted her a few times. Nothing. Uh, and she was a great girl, and I had a lot of fun talking to her. We always used to flirt and have fun on the air. I used to say a lot of stupid sexual things to her, which I could probably get in trouble for today. But she was a good sport, and I really miss her. So when I reach out to Leather, I'll see if I get them both on at the same time. It was really good hanging out with them at the Grammys when they both came in to perform with Doro. One of the last times she was in town before COVID. So uh, hopefully I get them all on here one more time. All right, we're going to do another set of music, and then we're going to wrap it up right after that. Maybe play one more tune. We'll see what's going on. How about uh, we do, uh, you know, we were talking, uh, you know, I'll save that for later. Let's do some Titan Steel, then we'll get into Paradox. We were talking about Chicago Metal before. A little Savage Grace and whatever else I could dig up uh, before the end of the show. So uh, let's go right into Titan Steel. Here's Night Gazer. <laughs>
Dr. Logue, Savage Grace, Fight for Your Life. I wanted to buy, he wrote like a diary, it's like a book, but you have to download it, it's only a PDF format. It's like $20, like 700 pages. I don't want to <laughs> be loading up the printer for two days and print up a 700 page book. If they put it out on in like real book format, I would buy it because it would probably be a fascinating read. I don't know if he talks about his medical career in there or what, but uh, on, on, the, on the Facebook page and on the website, it says that they're headlining uh, the Keeper of the Flame Festival in Mexico. I don't think anybody told the Keeper of the Flame Festival that because they're not even listed on the flyer. So <laughs> it's amazing I was headlining this show. It, it, they're almost like another Agent Steel. Savage Grace and Agent Steel should go out on tour together because that would be the funniest shit ever. These two guys are living in their own, <laughs> their own universe. Funny stuff. All right, well, we'll see you guys next week. I want to thank Mike for being on tonight's show. Everybody have a happy Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully the weather will get much better. It wasn't bad today, but I'm ready for the real hot summer weather to come here in New York. And we'll see everybody next Sunday night with Nige Rocket from Onslaught. Let's wrap it up with some uh, Anthrax, and I'll see you guys next week. Have a great week, everybody. This is Neil Turbin from Death Riders, and you're listening to Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show on Blog Talk Radio with Mike the Big Cheese. Don't forget to be fierce and stay thrashing and stay metal thrashing. Bye!